So um, the opposing side talked about how um, there these subsidies are money wasters that because of um, you know these unnecessary regulations um, that you know overproduction is happening and um, you know we're not controlling our commodity crops as well as we should like I mentioned corn um, which are actually the um, you know, commodity crops are the main crops that the big business farmers um, grow. Um, and so, uh, according to Winona Hodder of the, um, from the Huffington Post, she says that commodity crop overproduction has been around long before the current subsidy program existed. Um, they mentioned uh, the legislation in the past since Herbert Hoover to uh, you know, control the commodities, I'll go more in depth. Um, the, during the New Deal, uh, the government encouraged land, sorry, land idling, and uh, a grain reserve. Um, so that halted overproduction. So, you know, the economy's getting better. Um, in 1996, the government eliminated the land idling programs and eliminated the grain reserve. And then that's when the overproduction and the bankruptcy for farmers started happening. And because of that, the subsidies started being administered. So, more going into that grain reserve thing. Um, the U.S. used to have a grain reserve. We don't have it anymore. Um, why not? Um, well, the, uh, Dave Schechter from uh, CNN says that the, nationally far the National Family Farm Coalition believes a strategic grain reserve is needed to prevent livestock feed costs from escalating beyond a reasonable price. Um, they also say that um, it ensures sufficient grain amounts during the extreme loss, the, the extreme sorry, the extreme lows that the market is prone to due to you know, weather, things that you can't control. Um, and then, uh, this is from uh, Jim Harkness, who is the president of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. He says, although China, the world's largest wheat producer, maintains vast reserves of grain and is doing completely fine, like they're doing really well in farming right now, um, the United States has abandoned this wise approach. Um, so that just goes to show, you know, if we had a grain reserve, we you know, brought that back up, and overproduction would go down like it did back in the New Deal. Um, they talked about these um, unproductive regulations. Um, why don't we just change the regulations? Um, the true problem. This is according to Christophe uh, Palladier, who's a he's written numerous books on uh, agriculture. The true problem with subsidies is to have a cost-effective system. And uh, subsidies also need to deliver the right incentive to be effective. So how do we change that? Um, this is, again, Winona Hodder from the Huffington Post. Uh, she says that the demand and the, and the infrastructure needed to transition away from intensive commodity crop production no longer exists. So that's what we have to do. Ending, she says ending subsidies won't change this. Um, she goes on to say that we should reform the commodity policies in the Farm Bill and regulate the marketing to children of junk food. I'll get to that later. Um, she says eliminating subsidies may help reduce the federal budget in the short term, um, but the long-term impacts may land us with a food system that's even more consolidated and gives even more control to the big, um, big farmers. Um, what I mean by that is, um, she says that uh, for you know subsidies have been the safety net for uh, for farmers, you know, um, who. Who wouldn't be able to be, who wouldn't be able to stay in business otherwise? They mentioned that um, you know um, the big farmers that are already well off are getting the subsidies, most of the subsidies. But that doesn't mean that little farms um, don't need the subsidies that they're getting. It doesn't mean that little farms aren't getting subsidies. They are, and um, if they don't get them, a lot of the times they run out of business. Um, and when that happens, um, you have a market that's more saturated with big, um, big business farms, and there you have a even more control of them, which um, was the opposite of the intent. Um, let's see. I'm going to go to the junk food um, part of that. Um, you heard me say that she said that um, we need to make junk food, uh, you know, we need to regulate the advertising of junk food. Um, and you know, you might say that, well, junk food's really cheap, you know, the poor, like, that's, that's what they have to, you know, that's what they have to eat. Well, subsidies are not making junk food cheaper, this is according to Winona Hodder, and more abundant and healthy food. The real culprit is the deregulation of agriculture markets, the failure to enforce antitrust laws, and millions spent on marketing junk food. 
So, you know, um, if we regulate these agriculture markets, if we, you know, control, if the U.S. does a better job of controlling who these subsidies go to and what crops we subsidize, um, you know, we'll have a more, you know, more small farms with more subsidies. Um, and then they, they mentioned, uh, you know, my partner mentioned the corn ethanol. Um, well, All right, so this is according to uh, Michael Grunwald from the from Time magazine. He says that ever since the 80s, crop prices have soared along with subsidies due to the federal government's promotion of corn ethanol over more efficient renewable energies. Um, so uh, he says about 40%, oh sorry, this is the new guy. Rick Newman from the US News says that about 40% of the corn produced in America is used to make ethanol. And he says that ethanol is a gasoline additive that ends up in most of Americans' gas tanks. Um, he says that when corn becomes scarce and prices rise, ethanol production competes directly with the use of corn for food. So, you know, do we use this corn for our gas or for our food? Um, which causes a needless rise in food prices. So some experts are calling for Washington to temporarily issue waivers from the law so that more corn can be diverted away from ethanol production and help stabilize rising food prices, which would help consumers not just in the United States, but in poorer countries as well. Um, and my partner mentioned the, um, the, the other alternative uh, renewable energy source. Um, there's also uh, cellulosic ethanol, uh, which uh, according to Dan Shockley of the Daily Green, uh, makes next generation eth ethanol uh, made from waste or other biomass rather than corn at a fraction of the cost and with a fraction of the pollution and political fallout of corn ethanol. Um, 